My name is Jahidul Haq and I'm a 47 years old man and I actually born in Bangladesh but I came to the UK in 1980s when the, all these migration families start, Bangladeshi families start moving to the England those times I came to the England. I, I'm Newton, I live in Ealing, West London. My parents were originally from Bangladesh um, so depending on who asks me where I'm from, I'll either say I'm from England or I'm from London or I'm from Bangladesh. I was born here, mum was born in India, in Assam. Her mum and dad were both born in Assam in India. So in terms of identity, I would have to say Bengali. My name is, um, my official name is Abdul Salam. Uh, that is the name given to me by, by my parents. Um, the name that I use for uh, my, the, the projects that I do, various different projects, is Salam Jones. My name is Razia Sultana. I'm a henna artist. I came to this country when we, in 1982 with my mum and my grandfather. And um, before then, obviously, I lived in Bangladesh and the rest of my siblings were born here. And my parents are both from Bangladesh as well. So my name is Rini Lasker and my family are from Bangladesh. My father is originally from Assam in India and in the 1950s his family migrated over to Silet in, in Bangladesh. Um, my mother is, is originally from Bangladesh and I was born in Bangladesh. Uh, my name is uh, Zacharias Meyer. Uh, I'm Bengali. My parents come from an area called Silet. Uh, we were raised and schooled in Manchester. My parents, uh, my father, came in the late 30s, early 40s. My mother came in 1958. Well, my grandfather, my great-grandfather used to work. He came on the ships. I don't know too much information on that, but we just know when the visas, you know, when people are brought over for work. Mm -hmm. So my great-grandfather came over, and then later on, my mum's dad came, so my grandfather came over. And obviously you were allowed to bring your family with you. So he had applied for my mum. By then, my mum got married, I was born. So my mum was allowed to come over, but my dad wasn't. But obviously for a better life, my mum chose to come over and give it a go. And my dad was quite keen to send her over as well. And he was a Bangladesh freedom fighter. So he was like, you know, if she's got an opportunity, he wanted to send her over. My father, however, had, had been a resident of the UK previously, prior to my birth, for about a decade. So he was a migrant worker. He came here. Um, they, he, they sent him over from the four brothers. They sent him over because he was the educated one. So he knew how to read and write and speak English. So they thought, OK, we'll send you because you're going to be more productive. And the idea was in that... That, at, that, 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 at that time, in that generation, the idea really was to send them here um, to get them to work and then send money back home. My parents, uh, my father, came in the late 30s, early 40s. My mother came in 1958. So the story behind my father is quite interesting because uh, my father uh, joined the British Merchant Navy in about 1939, 1938 from Rangoon, which is now the capital of Burma, is now Myanmar. And from a very early age, he traveled the world and he finally stepped off and came to London. In the early days, my father opened a business in uh, a restaurant business called the Taj Mahal in Loxford Street, Manchester. So it could be said that my father is a little bit of a pioneer who came to this country in the very, very early stages. And um, because of that, he also opened a cinema day on a Sunday. Sunday was an important day because most of the people working had one day off. And my father used to bring films, Indian films, that were available. I used to hire the cinema for the Sunday and play, play the film. Now, that was quite an important time because there was no international cinema, there's no great television, and there's none of the media content we have today. So it was a fulcrum where society Indians, Pakistanis, Bengalis could meet and enjoy the Indian film, look back at the old Indian films of those days and eat their typical Coca-Cola and their samosas, which was the highlight of every movie. But what was interesting, they used to have an intermission, which was the break in the movie of these three and a half hour films. And my mother reminded me that she was given the task to walk down through the cinema and change the music to a 
Hindi music and uh, in her 60s, 1960s, Winkle Picker music, shoes and her sari. She was very young in those days, but that was for her quite an important time because it allowed her to meet the community. But my mother's life was quite interesting too because she's still alive and she tells me when she first arrived into Manchester with her sari on and her plaits came down to the floor, you see. So when she arrived, you know, she was quite a, a thing to see, something quite different. This young girl in the sari, long dark hair, flowing, flowing hair. And a lot of neighbours used to look at her and follow her around the streets to the, to the shops and things. So for her, it was quite an interesting time for her to come because there were not many Bengali people there at the time. So I have the records of my father's British seaman records of his travel through the, the Navy, 1938, 1939 onwards. And you see there quite interestingly, it's got British Indian officer, because it was India obviously, but also all the stamps are in Pakistan because it was also part of Pakistan too. And one of the, one of the references on his British seaman officer was, he was called a Mohammedan. So there were quite different uh, uh, content within those passports, those identif identifications that demonstrated a bit of Pakistan, a bit of India, and a bit of Bengal, all in one identification. So uh, looking at those records, it's quite interesting to see how three continents were one continent, basically, and they formulated the identification of their naval officers. Actually, growing up, I didn't even think much about the past because we didn't really have an extended family to learn from. So my mum was the only one who came in very much in the late 60s. So she didn't talk about the Liberation War. I guess she was here, obviously she was here during that time, but she never spoke about it. She never even talked about the partition. Only recently I got a glimpse of the past, should I say, because they celebrated you know, the India partition, you know, you know, 70 years on or whatever. And then it just popped out from my mum emotionally. Oh, my dad bicycled from Assam to Silet. I thought, God, how is that possible? So my mother, in effect, she was born in India. She grew up in East Pakistan before it became Bangladesh. And then she lived in, in, in England. Let me just show you a photograph. This is all that we have because they've been moving so much. You can see from my story, from Assam to Silet, it's just moving, constant moving. It must have been quite tough for them. But this is my great-grandfather, my mum's grandfather, my nan, probably sitting here with the little shorts. And um, yeah, this picture was taken in Guwahati, which is in Assam, and it does exist. So I guess he was walk working in law enforcement, my great-grandfather, um, during the British colonial years, because this is photo probably in the 1920s, I'm guessing, maybe 30s, I don't know. My, my grandmother never knew what year she was born. This is how it was. Um, and then um, these are all my nan's brothers and sisters. And to be honest, when I grew up, I always thought my grandmother only had two sisters. I had two nannies growing up in Silet. That's all I knew. I never questioned my grandmother had a family. These were all from India. This photo, let me go back to, it's not very visible, but my mum said her uncle had a watch strapped on his leg um, to show the British. In Bengali, the way they say it comes across a bit different. So I'm guessing in that period, maybe they had resistance or some issues with the British being there. Maybe they saw a lot of inequalities and a lot of things that didn't sit well with the local people. And that goes a little bit like, for example, they're all wearing cotton hair. During that period, that was a local product. But what was happening during that period, well, it looks like they're very proud of wearing the local clothes. Um, but during that period, like the Gandhi movement was happening, there were Gandhi started boycotting um, cotton, meaning cotton that was brought from India were being sold to England where there were lots of mills up in North England and they were being resold to people in India like Assam. But they would have to pay 10 times, 100 times more, which is beyond what they were earning. If we look at how the, the U United Kingdom and England historically has become successful, a lot of it is because of its colonial past where they've gone to countries like 
Calcutta in, for, um, in Bangladesh, Bengal when it was part of in India, and places like Africa, and they'd taken a lot of the resources from there and brought it back to the UK and pretty much made the UK, uh, you know, a lot of it what it is today. Um, so I think that there is this, there, there is this kind of roots of Bangladesh within the UK, but it's just not understood, it's just not out there. Partition is so important. I think we all have a duty to learn a bit more how it impacts each and every one of us, especially if you're from South Asian um, heritage. So someone like me, it impacted my family a lot. My dad was born uh, before partition, uh, 1935. So he used to joke that he was born British, part of the British Empire, then became Indian when um, the Britain, British uh, left India, then became uh, Pakistani, then came to this country and became a naturalised British person. But after independence, he also applied for Bengali citizenship. So he's uh, had five nationalities in his life. I remember my, we used to tease my mum and call her Pakistani and stuff, and she used to say, no, we, they always identified themselves as Bengalis. Yeah, so both, even my, my grandfather, my dad's side, they all said they associated themselves as Bengalis. I, I believe my parents would formally call themselves East Pakistani if they ever talked to uh, the doctors or school teachers or any British officials. But if they were talking to other Bengali people or other people of Asian origin, um, they would definitely say, we're from Bangladesh or we're Bangla people. I was born in Bangladesh um, just, after, just before the War of Independence. So I was actually registered. My, you know, like, we now have the, the, this really interesting story about my birth certificate. So my birth certificate, the serial number is 0000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000 something like 50. So I was like the 50th child to be registered in the new state of Bangladesh. Yeah? When, they, when Bangladesh government formed in 1971. So um, I was registered. Well, I was born in 1970. Um, I grew up in a tiny little village just on the outskirts of Silet, which is in the northeast of Bangladesh. Um, and I stayed there till I was five years old. My dad, he was in, um, he came here in 1962. Then that time was a Pakistan. Then when they, my dad and my uncle and all the stuff, then my dad always said, when they liberation, like the, uh, the freedom fight start, they used to work here and they used to hand over the half of the wage to the liberation fund. Well, my father, he talked about the Liberation War. He said around the Liberation War, he was actually a student. So he was very passionate about, about Bangladesh being the only country fighting for its language. So he, you know, my father can really speak, well, he's very well spoken in Bengali. He's a freedom fighter. So he would go, he'd take us to Bangladesh every year. And when every time we went, he, the way he was respected, they'd have all these honor, you know, special days where he'd go and he'd speak about his journey and stuff like that. And he did talk to us about when we were young. He'd tell us little stories, not too much, because we were too little to understand it all back then. But I really appreciate it now, learning more as I've grown up, to know that, you know, he fought for the language, for its independence. He was actually, he told us stories about how he got shot and how the bullet missed his leg, how he travelled to India to train up so he can fight to support, you know, Bangladesh and get the independence. My father didn't talk about Bangladesh that much because he travelled quite a lot throughout the 60s and, and the 70s, but my mother talked a lot about Bangladesh and she talked a lot about the um, 1971 liberation because her, fa her brother was killed, um, I think he was in the army and he was killed during that movement. Um, she also told us about how the army had come into her area and her village and during that time it was quite difficult for them and she said literally the rags that they used to um, clean the floor with they would wear those rags so they they could give the impression that they were really poor and you know so they wouldn't be attacked 
by these uh, soldiers from West Pakistan. We'd gone back for a family holiday to Bangladesh. It was the last big holiday to Bangladesh before I started school. So my parents were very aware that they might not be able to go back as often. One morning I woke up and um, my parents were sort of bundling a lot of our clothes and possessions into uh, bedspreads and the bed covers. And I was like, what's happening, what's happening? And they were going, uh, we, we've got to leave, uh, Pakistan's invading. Because even though Bangladesh was East Pakistan and at the time we were uh, classified as Pakistanis, um, my parents would always call it Bangladesh, Desh. Um, so they were saying, you know, the Pakistani army's coming, it's, it's uh, invading Bangladesh. I didn't really understand. I, I, I got the idea that we had to run away from bad people. So they, they packed a lot of our stuff, our clothes and everything, in two big bundles. Um, and I was going, can I take these books we've bought? And they're going, choose one book, choose one book. <laughs> so I chose one book, I think maybe two, and they got packed into the bundle. And then we started to leave my grandfather's house. And instead of going out the front door, we started going through the back of the house. And it's a typical Bengali courtyard style house with fields and ponds to the back. We were going through the back, through the fields, and I was like, this isn't the usual way. Uh, they were going, should be quiet, come on, come on, let's go, let's go. And we were going through all these fields, and I was going, oh yeah, my grandfather brought me here. This is a wheat field, this is a rice field, this is a, a corn field, barley field. <laughs> and they were going, come on, come on, let's go. And uh, we slowly got further and further from the house. Um, and it was uh, sort of more jungly. It was an area that I didn't recognise. And we were sort of sneaking through these uh, paths between the fields. Um, and at one point, um, there was a dry pond. Um, and we all went and hid in the dry pond. What I didn't realise is they were hiding in the pond because they believed that there might have been uh, Pakistani snipers or people that were uh, allied to the West Pakistani forces circulating. So we had to hide in this pond um, while these people were sort of in the jungle. We then just uh, got out the pond a little while later, carried on sort of um, willy-nilly in my perception running through all these fields till we came to a large poolside, um, riverside. And there was a choice. We could either go up across a bridge, across the river, or we could uh, go by boat. And so my parents were trying to hail a boat to take us across the river. I mean, it's a huge river. You could hardly see to the other side. Um, but I said, I don't want to go by river, I'm feeling scared and seasick. And, and the boats were taking a long time to come. There were helicopters circulating uh, above head. And so we went to the bottom of the uh, bridge, to the steps to get onto the bridge. And a soldier said, you better, if you want to cross the bridge, you better hurry, because they're looking to to maybe bomb the bridge and, and cut off an exit to India. What I didn't realise is at the time this bridge was quite near the border with India. So it wasn't actually a border bridge, but anyway, we ran up onto the bridge and we started running on this bridge. And my dad's carrying these two big bundles of all our clothes and possessions, etc. Um, we're running over the bridge. Uh, we get about three quarters of the way halfway across the bridge and my little legs <laughs> can't How run anymore. I was four and a half. Yeah. So we're running across this bridge. I couldn't run anymore. So I started going, well, <laughs> I can't, I can't do it anymore. And my dad was going, okay. So he was carrying me and these bundles and we were running across this bridge. The uh, bottom of the bridge was slatted. So as you ran 
um, you could just see the water through and I've got this memory of just looking like we were running across the water over water and we carried on running over this bridge I think halfway along the, so we, we there was other families so we'd sort of pass a family and then buddy up with another family and for me it seemed like ever running across the bridge got to the bridge came down the other side went through uh, a few alleys and it seemed a bit sort of green and lusher we went through an alley and we'd come to a town um, and I realized that there was something different it wasn't quite Bangladesh Growing up in Manchester is quite interesting because uh, as a young man, I had seven brothers and sisters, so we were quite a good team. We all went to school together. But the diversity of people was much less then as it is now. We didn't have that much of a community. There were scattered pockets of families. You know, three streets down, there'd be another family. A couple of miles down the road, there'd be another family. And when we travelled between houses, we were always careful to, to watch. We watched our backs. We looked over our shoulders. The, you know, we were careful to get home before dark because there was a lot of, lot of violence and a lot of attacks and it wasn't safe for us. And then as we started to get older and get bigger and fill out and get taller and hold our own and stand our own ground, that's when things changed. That's really when I think the, a lot of these, these racists realised that we're not an easy target anymore. Firstly, it's like, because tw I'm 12 years old, or 11, 12 years old, it's a bit hard. Reason is, number one, you can't speak the language. Secondly, it's like, it's a different environment. And then when I went there, first day when I went there, then the teacher was took me to class. Then I looked around. Then I sit with another Bengali guy because the reason is then I can communicate with him. But it was hard, but slowly, slowly, you know, we start developing. I actually remember the first time I heard the racist term packet. Um, I was actually about nine years old. We'd just come in to the classroom f from lunch and a boy barred my way and said, you can't come in, you're a packet. And I was so surprised that someone referred to me as something that wasn't an Indian, that I said, actually, I'm not from Pakistan. I'm from Bangladesh. Bangladesh used to be called East Pakistan, but after 1971, it became Bangladesh. And the boy was so, yeah, what's this other nine-year-old saying to me that he just sort of dropped his hand and let me go? Because I just bored him. <laughs> East London was a bit hard. Reason is, is a racism. When I grew up and as a young kid, it's when we go out, we have to watch our backs. Because those times, they used to call packy bashing. It's like when the other white kids saw us, they used to beat us up. Mm -hmm. Right? Then we like to be friend with the white kids. But because of we are the color, we don't, and the white kids don't be friend with us because he gets shamed. Are you friend of a Paki? That's the, that's the word, actual, the word used to use by those times. Mm -hmm. Then if, they, if, I, if I hang around the white boys, and if I go to school with the white boys, then other kids, they bully him. Ah, you friend of a Paki, right? then those kids don't used to mix up with us. Then every time we go out, we, we used to not only me, like all the kids, we used to get attacked. Then those times, my uncle said to me, if you want to survive, learn martial arts. Then at least you can defend yourself. White kid used to have a fun with us to beat us up and we used to run for our life. Their fun and we used to run for our life is very, very hard times, that is true. But slowly, after, I will say about 98, 
94. Yeah, about 90, 98, 97. Slowly, slowly, like it come down. Because our Bengali kids, when we grow up, we know the English. We used to communicate with the others. And slowly, slowly, the white community start accepting us. But it was hard. Initially, before I, um, before I reached a, si a, a substantial size, as in physical size, uh, it was very racist. We were bullied a lot, we were taunted a lot, we went through hell and back. Um, I mean, I can tell you stories about my childhood growing up in Mile End. My first experience of racism really was when I was a six-year-old boy and I just started to learn the language and, and my mother had allowed me to go out. And we just started school, so primary school. Um, and I stood outside my front door and these two English boys just walked past and for no reason, as they walked past, one turned around and punched me in the stomach. I was a six-year-old boy, and I, I, I could not for the life of me work out why he had done that. And then through, through, the, through the period of time, over a period of time, it dawned on me, these people don't like us for our color. That's, that's all it was, just literally color. It had nothing to do with anything else. Um, I experienced an a incredible level of racism growing up in, in East London. We used to have dog excrement through and through our letterbox. They were racist. They were, and, and the thing is, the sad thing is, they didn't know why they were being racist. They just knew that's how they were. It was a culture of racism. As a consequence of that racism, it made me strive even harder. I've strived to be better than my British, English, white peers around me. Does that make sense? So I've always, I've never really given anybody a reason or an excuse to look down on me or, or, or talk down to me. And I think a, a, a huge contributing factor to that is the, the racism that I experienced as, as a child. Now it's changed, but if you ask me that, that would, now is it more worse than before, I would say. Reason is, before, we used to know the devil, he don't like me, he's going to hit me. Now I would say institutional racism. You don't know the devils. He talked to you nice. He hugged you, but he stabbed you in the back. Before you know that he's going to hit me, I get prepared. Right? Physically or whatever, he will do something to me. But now, it's a different. But I said that this is my, my way to say it. Then I find this like, now is a bit dangerous one. But now is, how do I say it? Because I don't have a proof. I can't give you any proof, right? But say if, now, hold on, is a few days ago on the news, it said Bangladeshi generation is get less wages than is a white counterpart. That was in the news, yeah? And now it's 2019, yeah? And, well, now it's a July, yeah? And a few days ago it was in the news. That's an example there, right? This is the biggest example I can say. I would call myself a British Bengali because growing up you weren't really, you know, at, at secondary school, at primary school, you weren't really seen as part of, you know, the community too much. You were always treated, you know, there was a little bit of racism in schools. I remember as a young kid in primary school often being bullied by the white kids just because being from a Bengali background. And even to the point I actually remember as a t at 10 years old, a young boy came up to me and he just, he just started on me for no reason. Being a girl, I was just, because my parents had like, from really strong backgrounds, and they were really tough people. I remember I actually fought this young boy and uh, I, didn't, I don't even know, it was just the fact that constant bullying, it really brings that out to you. And I remember having a fight with him. And you know, at the end, I remember my head teacher, even though we both got, grant, like, got detention, I remember the head teacher come up to me and said, Rizzi, you should have got him ages ago. <laughs> So, you know, it just, that kind of made me feel like, yeah, I didn't do anything wrong. I came to a point in my life where I had a lot of questions about my heritage. Now, bearing in mind, up to this point, I had never been to Bangladesh. So when I came here at the age of five, up till the age of 42, I had never been to Bangladesh. 37 years, I didn't want to go. I, I just felt like it was... Um, all the stuff I'd heard about Bangladesh was very negative. I, I had a lot of questions. Both my parents had passed away by that time. 
I had a lot of questions that the only way I could get answers to was really to go back to my country. And also a part of me felt like, you know what, if I, if I die tomorrow, I would love to see my country one more time. I want to see the place that I was born in. So I wanted to go, and it really was a journey of self-discovery. I traveled, backpacked my way around the entire country for three months. So, and I went to places that even Siletis have never heard of. And I discovered a, a whole country, not just one culture, but 20 different cultures, 20 different languages, 20 different peoples. I have a lot of good memories of Bangladesh. What I would, I mean, I used to go back regularly when I was a child. In total, I think I've been about 13 times. Um, I associate Bangladesh with a very green and beautiful country. When I was young, I always thought that it was like paradise, that this is the place that I could retire in. It's so peaceful, it's so quiet. Um, and these are the villages. I mean, my father's from the town, but we spent more time at my mother's um, house, which is, which is in the vill villages. It seemed to me like a place where you didn't need much to be happy. In fact, a few years ago, quite a few years ago, Bangladesh was voted one of the happiest nations in the world. I would say my family did preserve Bangladeshi culture because like, this was the first sari my mum bought when she came in 1982. And I still have it, so this sari is like, really old and it's very dear to me. You know, my mum, you know, I took it from her to wear it at a wedding and it's so beautiful. And the fact that I've been able to look after it, and I wear it even now, and people still ask me, Razia, where did you buy that? And I, you know, the heritage we have, that we came to England, and then we had places like Brick Lane, where we could buy saris, and we can go and eat Indian food. Well, we say Indian food, but originally the food comes from where Bengalis, Bengali chefs who came in, what my grandfather, I think he came in the 70s. I was also very aware of being bilingual, so from a very small age, um, we lived in a flat in South Ealing uh, until my third birthday. I, I do have memories and my parents told me that um, I used to play little games like, you know, this is a cup in English, what's the Bengali for this? Or this is blah, blah in Bengali, what's the English? And I quite liked having that idea of two languages and a language that maybe my nursery friends didn't understand. Okay, so this is a rickshaw. People may have seen these in lots of Asian countries like China or India, but these were actually created in Bangladesh. So this is made in Bangladesh. When I think of my childhood in, in Bangladesh, I think of um, riding on a rickshaw. And it's such a cultural, um, object because, and, and you know, cultural thing to do in Bangladesh because the majority of Bangladesh, they don't earn much money. They work hard to save up for a rickshaw and the minute they have a rickshaw, the running costs are like minimal um, and it provides a source of income for a lot of people there. And for the people who ride on it, it's just such a pleasure. The art that I, ha I do, it represents Bangladesh in a huge way. The, you know, most of the clients I have, they're all brides. Bengali, most of them are actually Bengali brides. And then I've taken some of that culture and I've created other stuff, like I've done fashion runways. You know, brides adorn their foreheads with um, these white sort of patterns on their foreheads to rep for their wedding day. I've actually taken that concept and I've done modest fashion runways where I've had, they've not done bridal work on their foreheads, but we've taken that concept and I've used it on the fashion runway. And then taking certain customs, like traditional brides and grooms, they drink milk on their wedding day. So I've like created glasses and flutes, and they're all like influenced by henna. And you can see the designs, they're all hand painted. And then obviously modern Britain, Bang Bengalis, I've done the flute glasses as well. And these are all hand painted, heavily influenced by um, henna designs. Our holidays were mainly to Bangladesh. Every, most, uh, every couple of years, my dad would take us to Bangladesh. But even though we identified ourselves as Bengalis, when we went to Bangladesh, we were seen as a foreigners. So it was quite, that used to knock us back a bit, because you, you go to Bangladesh and you're still called a foreigner. You come to England, you're still called a foreigner. So that was quite difficult as a young child to be called like, you know, they'd, they'd call us Londonese. You know, we came to, so we were treated like a foreigner back in our own country, where I used to call home. If I say I'm a British, my name is Jahidul Haq. People don't know. Who's Jahidul Haq? 
who is that? And if, if somebody say, oh, that Bangladeshi boy, Jahidul Haq, they will identify you. Then I will say, I'm a British Bangladeshi person because my heritage is a Bangladeshi and I'm the British brought up guy. I feel I'm a British as well, but the society is not allowing me. Because if you go to, if I, if I go to the, any other countries and, and if I say I'm a British person, he'll say, no, where are you from? He asked you two, three times, where are you from? Then I have to say, history. My parents is Bangladeshi. He come 1962. Now I am the British. Now I have to add the story. Then he believed me. My home is a Dockland, which is Isle of Dogs in Tower Hamlet. Always is my home will be in Tower Hamlets. I think um, being British and being of Bengali parentage is so um, intertwined in my being that I can't actually say what is being British and what is being Bengali because I am what I am in a mix of, of both cultures. My home is in Britain because that's where I feel more co most comfortable but I'm really proud of my Bengali heritage. That's why I'm wearing a bit of the cotton today. Home has many dimensions I suppose. Home is in your heart, the home is in your mind, and home is experience. And I think my, I have my, homes, my homes exist where my parents live, and that'll be both England and Bangladesh, and I regard England as my home, and it's been my home throughout, but my heritage is also Bengali. Home? <laughs> um, UK. Home is always going to be Bangladesh. Whether my children will say the same thing, I don't know, but for me, home is always Bangladesh remembering going to see my grandparents, who some of them have passed away now, but you know, remembering the tea gardens that my dad used to take me to, seeing the house that I was born in. When, I know the house I was born in Bangladesh, my dad was actually born in the same house. So, you know, going to see these places and that's always going to be my memory and it's always going to be home. You, you may take the Bengali out of you know, Bangladesh, but you'll never take Bangladesh out of the Bengali.